uh, in collaboration with our university. We are happy to have with us today, Jared Quack, who is the member of Sri Society Singapore branch and who has practiced integral yoga uh, for 20, for the last 20 years. He holds also two postgraduate degrees from the University of Oxford, specializing in Indian philosophy, Christian theology, and business administration. He works in the education sector and invests in technology companies. His thesis, by the way, was on integral monism. That's I want to mention from my side the comparative study of Kashmiri Shaivism and Sri Aurobindo's integral philosophy. He was comparing also the monism of Advaita and uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, as well as uh, cosmogenesis of, and the realistic idealism of Kashmiri Shaivism and that of Sri Aurobindo. Uh, today, Jared will focus on the stage of mental subjectivism as it is described by Sri Aurobindo in the human cycle, pointing out the, that despite the apparent darkness and chaos, there is every sign that the world is entering into the, this new and wonderful era of spiritual age. Sharing some thoughts on the myth of Atlantis and its uh, cardinal importance to the coming age of mental subjectivism, briefly contrasting this vision of the future with that offered by Western transhumanists who believe in using human augmentation technologies to alter society and its destiny. So I welcome you, Jared, please take a lead and make your presentation. After his presentation, which will take some time, longer than expected because it's quite deep and profound, uh, we uh, kind of, uh, it may take uh, something like 40, 45 minutes. We will have a question and answer session. Please, Jared. Okay. You can so project. Well, yeah, sure. You can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Just checking. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start the slideshow. Vladimir, thanks again for the invitation uh, and good evening from Singapore. Uh, everyone's attending. So uh, Vladimir, can, you can see the slides clearly? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay, okay. My slide projection is slightly blocked by the, the Zoom the people here, but you you see the slides only, right? All right. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. So today, um, what I'm talking about really is inspired by Sri Aurobindo's The Human Cycle, uh, a very beautiful book that really talks about social evolution, as we shall talk about. I mean, we know, I think most of us know a lot more about individual evolution, individual yoga, in a sense. Uh, but actually, Sri Aurobindo is extremely different or should provide some really original insights on how society as a whole must change in order to accommodate the supramental manifestation. So if we look at the conventional views of the future by science fiction, by politicians, by business people, we're basically looking at a highly technological, uh, the advanced society, a world of autonomous cars, drones, robots, AI, genetic engineered organisms, starships. I mean, we all know all the science fiction. Or, I, in fact, I just, I am a Star Trek fan to some extent. So I am quite um, cognizant of what, I mean, how does the world generally view the future? It's a highly technological, physically advanced world. And of course, uh, Vladimir was briefly mentioning a transhumanist philosopher. One of the, like, big Nick Bostrom from Oxford's uh, Future of Humanity Institute, they believe that we should use human technology to change the human body. And that is really the next step forward. To merge with the machine is really the next step forward. So that is a very widespread view and very powerful and predominant supported by, indirectly or directly, by a lot of people. 
But Fiorabindo actually predicts a very different trajectory. I'm assuming almost everyone here is already familiar with the basics, at least, if not a lot more, in fact, of Fiorabindo's philosophy. So certain things I will just be browsing over. So Fiorabindo actually predicts a very different trajectory, I think, like what most of us already know. Instead of this linear projection of more machine, I mean machines now to more machines later, more advanced machines later, he really projects something that is more like a curve, not a linear projection, but extraordinary bending of the curve that would take humanity to unforeseen and unforeseeable, actually, horizons. Very briefly, as I say, we are talking in the family, so to speak, most of us know what we're talking about already. He predicts the holistic transformation of the human organism by the spirit, by the divine spirit, leading to the creation of a renewed humanity, which will so of coexist with a new superhuman species, what we call the supramental being. So this will in turn culminate in the destruction of evil and a complete reign of God in individuals, in society, in the world. As I mentioned earlier, really, it's a social thought in which Sri Aurobindo really, really, is really, really or original. He is original in many, many ways. But in terms of portraying a kind of spiritualized community, I think it's really without compare. And of course, the, this is well known, but I think perhaps what is somewhat less well known is that actually Sri Aurobindo actually set up a rather clear roadmap on the attainment of this social change. And that is actually quite extraordinary because if we look carefully at his books, I, I'm, I wish to venture the point that we are actually looking at great changes in the next few decades. We are not looking at something far away. In fact, I think we can make a very strong case that Sri Aurobindo is predicting something that will take place, that's already taking place and we will bear very significant fruit in the next few decades. So that is really what I am arguing for and uh, showing, uh, sharing his books from that angle in this presentation before we do the questions and answers. So to fully understand his stages, uh, we need to look at Sri Aurobindo's psychology, so to speak. So Sri Aurobindo briefly believed in that man is divided into in the external level, in the three levels, the mind, the vital, and the physical. The vital refers to the life force, the mind to, and the outer level, the intelligence, the physical, of course, refers to the body. And then we have this much vaster being called the subliminal, which there are a lot of, lots of things, which many of you are familiar with and I'm not going into, but this is actually much a much vaster province of our being. And on top of that is the so-called central being, the divine man, which is the spark of the divine, so to speak, which is connected to our soul here. But what is important to note is the differentiation, the three layers here, because this is actually central to his social thought as well. As we didn't so without, as above, so below, right? The old hermetic formula. So for Sri Aurobindo, it's the same. As we didn't, so without. Whatever is in the human nature is mapped onto the social nature. And as we evolve individually, so shall we evolve socially. So really he talks about three stages, so to speak. I'm oversimplifying somewhat, um, but this is to give a uh, brief, the large schema. So he says that as we approach the spiritual age, we will shift from rationalistic materialistic focus. That means we focus on oh, all is matter and is mechanistic, Newton's law, of uh, laws of motion apply to everything and so on and so forth. And that is uh, this strong materialistic focus. We will start from there, from matter, from body, but we will move on a social level collectively to start to focus more subjectively. We look inwards more as a society. I need to emphasize that, not as individuals, on the vital force, the life force as the ultimate reality. So first we think maybe we are a bunch of atoms uh, that basically we can explain everything by physical laws, by mechanistic laws even, not even the more subtle quantum kind of phenomenal, but something mechanistic. But later on, we move on. Society, he predicts, will move on. In fact, he, when he writes, as I shall say later, he already believes they are deep into it, into some kind of vital subjectivism. That means we believe that the life force itself is the ultimate, the Brahman, the ultimate. And 
based on that, we should view the whole of society, we should view the whole of the universe, and we should view ourselves as manifestation of life force. But he believes that after that, we'll move on to mental subjectivism, where we believe that the mind is the ultimate. The mind is the true reality. Mind, however defined, of course. And that will be the final stage before we move on to the spiritual age, so to speak. So this is the threefold movement that Sri Aurobindo predicts. Now I'll focus on the paragraph from, uh, I think I have to, okay. I'm moving out because the, the text is blocked by the picture. Uh, but let me can I just check, can you still see the slides? Yeah, we, we see, see we see the slides. The, the the point that you don't see the slides. How can you read then? How why don't yeah, you correct. see the slides? I don't understand. We all see it. It's projected. No, no. So when the slideshow is shown, part of my words will be blocked by the um, oh I found a way. I found a way. Okay, okay. You I can move your picture zoom. away also. You can make it smaller. Yeah, I have just done that. Okay, so it's just my zoom knowledge. <laughs> okay, so let me just restart. Uh some current slide. Okay, so uh, Vladimir can still see the slide, right? Everything is fine. Okay, so there are, I will just read this. Um, Sri Aurobindo's writing is mantric and there's a deep truth to it. So, however, because of time constraint, what I could do is only to read it once and briefly talk about it. Uh, the slides and the original article in which I base all this on, because I wrote an article in 2019 about this. In fact, this presentation is only the sort of a summary of the first part. So I will just read through this text and we'll leave you all to think about it uh, and read it again, hopefully, maybe after this uh, webinar. The human intellect in modern times has been first drawn to exhaust the possibilities of materialism by immense dealing with life and the world upon the basis of matter as a soul reality, matter as the eternal, matter as the Brahman, Anam Brahma. Afterwards, it had begun to turn towards the conception of existence as a large pulsation of a great evolving life, the creator of matter, which would have enabled it to deal with our existence on the basis of life as the original reality, life as the great eternal, Brahno Brahma. And already it has in gem, in gem, in preparation, a third conception the discovery of a great self-expressing and self-finding inner mind other than our surface mentality as a master power of existence. And that should lead towards a rich attempt to deal with our possibilities and our ways of living on the basis of mind as the original reality, the great eternal, Mano Brahma. So this is from Human Cycle 2534. Later on, when you see the page number, this will be from the Human Cycle alone because I will not be citing the work anymore. So I think we can see uh, from the three paragraphs that Sri Aurobindo really predicts three stages, as you can see, where we focus on different layers of our being as the ultimate reality. Again, I emphasize this is about how society or a society as a whole view reality. It's not about one individual. It's collectively how we change our points of view as we evolved. Now, of course, you may say, this, if this is something really, really far away, then in a certain sense, it is good to know, but it's not that relevant. But as I argue at the start, this is not something far, far away. In fact, even though despite the darkness of what we see, uh, all the phenomena, I'm sure you can recognize what's going on in many of these pictures, um, it seems like we are stuck in darkness, in chaos. It does not seem like we are going anywhere, right? I mean. But the fact is, actually, we can make a very strong case from the writings of Sri Aurobindo. He actually indicates quite clearly that we are, in fact, in the later part of the third stage. We are, in fact, in the later part of the third stage. We are not even in the first stage or the second even. We are, in fact, deep into the third stage already. The first stage, I shall argue, and from his writings, in fact, it's quite clear. He refers to the, it to be the 19th century, the early 20th century. Um, vital subjectivism is a stage which stretches from the late 19th to the end of World War II. 
And actually, we can argue, even though he does not state that directly, from World War II onwards, we are actually already entered into the foundational stage of the mental subjectivism. And now we may be reaching the end of the first stage. This may seem surprising, but I don't think for us who are so-called in, in the circle, we know about the supramental descent. We believe in the supramental descent in 1956. Clearly, we, it is perfectly rational to believe in a great acceleration. And Sri Aurobindo also predicted that this fast movement from one stage to another is also a sign that the time has come. And we do know the time has come. So in itself, it's not too surprising. But if you look at his works, again, this is a quick reading of his work, not the deep study that we should usually bring to uh, this. You can see here that after the material formula which governed the greater part of the 19th century, had burdened men with the heaviest servitude to machinery of the outer material life, the first attempt to break through, to get to the living reality in things and away from the mechanical life, idea of life and living in society, landed us in that surface vitalism which had already begun to govern thought before the two formulas inextricably locked it together, lit up and flung themselves on the lurid fire of the World War. This World War here, given the time of writing, actually refers to the First World War. So you already can see that the the rationalistic material formula is really something of the 19th century. And by the time he was writing in the early 20th century, he already said they are deep into, they are already into the vital subjectivist stage. And in fact, even at that point, he was predicting that vitalism will come to disaster because it's incomplete. And it came to disaster, of course, in the developments of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, where the worship of power and the reign of the Asura reach its climax. This titanism ended exactly as you have reversed, predicted in something violent, huge, colossal, or doom in its very nature to access and ruin because light is not in it, nor the soul's truth, nor the sanction of the gods and their calm, eternal will and knowledge. In this great excess, much of the world was brought to ruin. But at the same time, it was effectively, I would think, the end of vital subjectivism. Sri Aurobindo did right in the human cycle that vital subjectivism need not have been disastrous, but the problem was that the kind of vital subjectivism that took hold in the world was the most, was a very incomplete, distorted kind of vital subjectivism, and therein lies the problem. In theory, at least, there was a possibility of a vital subjectivism that was Great, because after all, prana, I mean, the life force is too a divine force. There's nothing evil in itself intrinsically, but it didn't work out that way. In any event, more importantly for our age, is that something really remarkable happened after World War II. First of all, vitalistic thought, like Ilan Vital in the life force in biology and all that stuff, and the will to power and all those things in politics, that gave rise in a distorted form to Nazism all fell out of fashion. They are out of fashion totally. In biologists, you will not find a biologist today, a serious biologist anyway, that will argue for a life force flowing through your body and that kind of thing. You still get it in Ayurveda or you get it in Qigong in China, but you don't get it in conventional uh, medicine, Western medicine anyway. And World War II marked the invention, as we shall see, rather momentous consequence of the first electronic computers the late 1940s, I think it's 48, if I remember correctly, witnessed the publication of Shannon's seminal paper on information theory. Information theory and then the electronic infrastructure made possible the infrastructure of our information age, wireless communications, satellite communications, and of course, the internet. So the information age really began around the mid 20th century. I do not think it's a coincidence it began after the fall of vital subjectivism. In fact, if we look closely from in the light of Sri Aurobindo, in the beginning of mental subjectivism, we should expect the outer mind to be developed first, which means this mind, I mean, the thinking mind, dynamic mind, the external or physical mind, this should be developed first. And actually, if we look objectively at what has happened over the last 70 years, we see this happening exactly. We already entered, it seems, into a collective attempt to deal with the possibilities and our ways of living on the basis of mind as original reality. 
we first see the greater and greater development of the outer mind and externalized reason. We see it first in the mechanical manifestations of this mind. The supercomputer being the archetype, the internet, artificial intelligence, which has really taken off in the last five to seven years because of advancement in hardware. Actually, the software was, I mean, the algorithms were available long before, like deep learning was there for a really long time, but the hardware took off in the last about five to seven years. And so the exponential development of this mechanical manifestation of this mind is very clear and undeniable. And certain countries like the United States has been really leading in this great manifestation. There's also been a mass democratization of education and mental training throughout even the poorest countries. Uh, I mean, China was a very poor country at the start of the, the mid 20th century but there was a vast, India as well, and, but there was a vast push for education across all, most of the countries of the world. Literacy rate, numeracy, all increased throughout the whole world. Is this really an accident? And most importantly, I would say, we begin to understand the universe in a computational way. Now, what does that mean? To understand that we have to understand, of course, and I think many of us who work in this field will know that computer simulations have become more and more powerful. For instance, we can use multi-scale modeling to model systems of different levels from the, all these molecular networks, the cellular networks, the organ networks to create the individual. And this in turn can be uh, modeled on, as a social network. Of course, to run such a simulation is heinously, um, computationally very expensive, but we are getting to that point where we can do a lot of such things. You know, computer simulations have become more and more powerful. And this is one of the reasons, not the only, I'm simplifying the issue quite a bit, that um, a lot of high profile physicists and philosophers really have started seriously considering whether reality is really a computer simulation. Like this is an MIT scientist who wrote this book called The Simulation Hypothesis. Are we all like video game characters living in the matrix? However, to ask this question is really to ask the same question as this, if you really think about it. Whether it's a comp, because if you think that we live in a computer simulation, then obviously the generator of reality is a computer, is a physical or is a mind, it's a cosmic mind of some kind. Therefore, it really goes back to asking these modern physicists and philosophers are asking the same question. They're going back to a version of idealism, which is, uh, I mean, taking mind as the original reality. And this is not something that is woolly or is something that's increasingly mainstream. And that again is along the lines of what Sri Aurobindo has predicted. Because what he predicted is, if we go back a bit, that we will see mind as the original reality. Mind as the original reality. And that's exactly what is happening now as the computational view of the universe and the computational paradigm take over completely from the vitalistic paradigm. And we see it in every field. Biology, we have bio bioinformatics. We see it in economics where we liken the market, the stock market to a supercomputer. We see in the way we think about education, we see in psychology, where we liken the human mind and consciousness to a computer. The computational metaphor has become so powerful, it has been dominating so many different fields of philosophy, science, and politics, economics. And isn't that exactly what Sri Aurobindo has predicted, that we are going increasingly to see mind as the original reality. So I leave you with this quite interesting thought. And then linking back, of course, to this year, I mean, I read a kind of joke saying that net, this year, the it seems like the newspaper headlines have been taken over by net, Netflix script writers. You know, every, every single week, especially in the United States, uh, you, you see interesting things happening. And so this is truly a very interesting year. So, uh, but of course, Besides the interesting things that have been happening, we would like to see in the light of Sri Aurobindo. So what could be the significance of this? If we are talking, if really we are deep into the foundation of mental subjectivism, what is the significance of 2020 really? I mean, I'm not saying this is the only significance. I believe this is a hinge year for many, many reasons. But for the purpose of this talk, I would say these four 
trends will be extremely important. We have seen the acceleration of online interactions, the one we are having right now. We have seen the vast explosion of e-commerce in uh, America, Europe, China, across the world. Digital payments have taken off uh, a lot more. I'm not saying it started to take off, but this is an exponential explosion. AI and automation have been growing a lot for the last five to 10 years, AI in particular. But this year, really, it's also augmented. And I will, this is a big point, uh, but I will only briefly talk about it. Um, this year, due to international tensions and various other reasons, China has been forced to sort of get smarter faster. So I assume that it will probably lead to the faster development of things like computer chips, quantum, this is called only quantum technology, digital currencies. Uh, in the last two, China is already to a great extent leading. So we do not know how we develop, but the United States clearly has been the leader in terms of the development of in the information age, that's without a doubt. But perhaps that we, uh, the US has sort of awakened this sleeping giant here. And if you really, this is, I can only go very briefly. If you really look at the history of Chinese technical prowess, it's actually quite remarkable that China has been ahead of say Europe by on average of about a thousand years for many, many areas of technology, anything from cast iron, which is actually very significant for making productive agricultural tools to gunpowder, movable type, and uh, to toilet paper and toothbrush, or whatever it might be. So China has been a very, very inventive nation uh, historically. Viewed from the eyes of Sri Aurobindo, of course, we, we do not see these things as being merely adventitious. It's something in the national soul. And, uh, and for, 2020 probably marks a further awakening of this Chinese technical prowess for whatever consequence it might have. Just a brief like introduction, for instance, if you look at just this one industry that you find in China, you can see that this is a very, very old industry. Jade carving has been in China since the Stone Age, actually, 3,500 BC. So that's 5,500 years ago. But more importantly, China never stayed static. You will see that China actually progressed in jade carving for at least five different generations of them for 5,000 years. Even till today, the same great uh, jade artists are still carving, but they're using completely different tools from their ancestors and they have been still improving. So I believe that uh, this awakening of Chinese technical powers or the acceleration will have pretty momentous consequence for the world, although it's not something, the consequence I could fully outline or spell out or fully understand really at this stage. But perhaps it has something to do with the acceleration of the information age as well. So really what we think, I think maybe the true meaning of the information age in the eyes of Sri Aurobindo is that it does construct the physical foundation and nervous system for an age of mind. It creates this body, this planetary mind to do that. And it brings our foundational external mental powers to their fullest development. And I will argue quite strongly that in the last 70 years, it in fact has already been accomplished to a very great extent. And 2020 is the year of the pivot, the final push, I would say. So what we see is something quite extraordinary that has happened in the last 70 years. Even the humblest members of society, uh, a farmer in India, uh, somewhere someone stuck in the hills of Yunnan in China, or uh, some very poor person in Africa with a mobile phone can access much information and therefore power and extraordinary speeds. The, the, that African peasant we are talking about is probably more powerful than some kings of long ago because of that. And in a reversal of the parable of Tower of Babel, which I think more of us are familiar with, uh, humanity will, could now work, trade and collaborate with much greater ease. We have come together much more. And increasingly, internet, uh, interconnected network of AI have been developed with ever-growing speed and power. I was Google is uh, the, uh, one of the archetypal example. I expect Google to become one of our world's first planetary AI, actually, given the amount of data is amassing and all those things. So these are extraordinary things. Maybe uh, in, on its worldwide scales, like probably something never seen before in the history of humanity. Um, and something that has empowered humanity to a huge extent. Yet, the very power it has given us is juxtaposed with the very frustrating reality that actually our fundamental problems remains quite unsolved. So, and I believe that in the light of Sri Aurobindo, because he believes in this 
nature of how all problems are about creating harmony between opposites, right? And so I believe that this is actually a clear sign that humanity is ready to move on to the next arc of our development. And that to me is something quite um, hopeful and inspiring that despite our huge problems, um, what the progress we have made in this next last 70 years show that actually we, we are about to break through. I don't think it's something actually very far away, especially after this year. And actually, Sri Aurobindo already predicted this in his prescient words. He says, I mean, before I talk about this, he, he basically read this. He basically says that the, the first stage of mental subjectivism is, is actually marked by the ex explosion of rationality or the vast expansion of rationality. But he says already, it's not going to solve the fundamental problems. And that's exactly, I think, the stage we are in right now. So I'll just read this three. This first stage, or mental subjectivism is foreshadowed in an increasing tendency to rationalize entirely man and his life, to govern individual and social existence by ordered scientific plan based upon his discovery of his own and of life's realities. This attempt is bound to fail because reason and rationality are not the whole of man of life. Reason is only an intermediate interpreter, not the original knower, creator and master of our being of cosmic existence. It can be said only mechanized life in a more intelligent way than in the past. To all to do that seems to be all that the modern intellectual leaders of the race can discover as the solution of the heavy problem which, with which we are impaled. Strong words. Heavy problem with which we are impaled. So in essence, he has already sort of foreseen this failure that despite 70 years where we push our reason and our outer mind to the planetary level, not the the supercomputers of today can do things that are completely undreamt of, undreamt of by those terrible computers, room size thingies that, that existed in the 1940s. The smartphone we hold in our hands can do more, much infinitely more than those early computers. Not to mention the most powerful computers, not to mention the entire internet. We have so much rational power, so much data at our command. And yet, exactly like what he said, we are still impaled with the heavy problem of our human existence, actually. So what do I predict will come after 2020 given, in the light of Shira Bindo and given this situation? So I guess it's a mix of both good news, very good news, and some very bad news. First, I think we will reach the climax and then we will reach the decadence of the information age. 2020 actually gives a faster push, the push on Chinese tech, or the, the digital commerce, and so on and so forth. We will see the development of ever greater artificial intelligence, robotics. We will see greater interconnectivity, 5G, 6G, 7G, don't know which level. We will see e-commerce, our outward mental power, education, and so on and so forth will expand. But we will also see ever greater social instability and inequality. I think that's actually quite obvious, especially AI and automation. They're going to take away a lot of jobs. Um, there have been differing levels of predictions, but easily we can expect 20 to 30 to 40 percent of jobs being lost to automation alone. And that will mean greater inequality. And we are leaving aside this COVID recession that we are talking about. And we will also face ever more problems that we simply cannot solve because of international rivalry, because of our human consciousness and ignorance, because of our selfishness, climate change. With all our power, we still cannot really properly. We have pandemics, wars, psychological disorders. So while we are getting more and more powerful, more and more information, at the same time, I believe we will be brought to a moment of greater and greater crisis, at least till we break through. So this is what I think will likely happen post-2020 in the next decade. And the first signs of it is actually, this fear is almost like a microcosm of the future. Uh, it's already a lot of things is already working itself out. So of course then the important question is given this mix of good and bad news through the pressure of the darkness and most importantly, the secret working of the super mind, what will emerge? Again, Sri Aurobindo actually has an answer for that already in the human cycle. It, it seems as if somehow he has already foreseen this really nice long roadmap all the way to uh, the spiritual age. 
he actually predicts that we will breach the barrier between the outer being and the subliminal being. He does not predict that on an individual level. There have been plenty of people, relatively speaking, who has did that before on the individual level. But he's saying that we will do something quite much rarer, that is on the social level, in certain communities, there will be a mass breaking of this barrier between the subliminal, which is our larger mind, life, and body, and the external being. He believed that on the, on the collective level, our surface mentality and our inner being, our inner mind, life, and body will be unified. That means many people in certain given communities will do that. And certain societies will give first place to the development of one inner being, not first place to economic development or technological development or, or even higher things like education or morality, but the development of one's inner being will start taking first place. And of course, this will naturally take place in pioneering communities. All of us, of course, recognize the mushroom deal here. So we are talking about certain collectives and certain countries maybe that will push ahead in this direction faster than others. And that is essentially what he predicts. That true, and I think 2020 has given a sort of impetus to this breaking of the barrier through the crisis, through the uh, pushing the final stage of the physical information infrastructure at least. So I'm now going to read the part in Shia window where he sort of predicts this. But it is conceivable that this tendency to mechanize life may hereafter rise to the higher idea of man as a mental being, the soul in man that must develop itself individually and collectively in the life and body through the play of an ever-expanding mental existence, through the greatening of his mental and psychic being and the discovery bringing forward an organization of subliminal nature and its forces and the utilization of a larger mind and a larger life waiting for discovery within us. So I'm just getting the, to get the time. Okay, so what he really predicts is, what he really predicts is, a profound change in certain communities of the world. And he writes beautiful things about it. Yes? Sorry? Oh, nothing. Okay. So he writes beautiful things about it. Of course, before this beautiful stage, I believe we must still pass through this rather unfortunate um, coexistence of light and darkness. But he does predict a breakthrough. I cannot tell you, of course, how far you will be my own sense is that it's not as far away as we may think because 2020 has given a really big push in this direction. Things may be happening that we do not know of that lead to a much faster consummation than what we may expect. And that, I guess, is the hope. So what he really talks about is this beautiful era. It's not the spiritual age yet. It's the final, final stage, in a way. An era will give a new tone and atmosphere, a loftier spirit, a wider horizons, a greater aim to the whole of society. And he predicts great things in science, in art, and in international relations and social interactions. Chiravindo says that it might, the mental subjectivist communities might easily develop a science which will bring the powers of the physical world into real and not a contingent and mechanical subjection and open perhaps the doors of other worlds. In other words, he's talking about magic or occultism or whatever you may choose to call it, but a, a technology and a science that, that understand and can work with nature directly without the need for a lot of cumbersome machinery like what we have to do. It might develop an achievement of art and beauty which will make the greatness of the past a comparatively little thing, little thing that even the Leonardo da Vinci of the past will be thrown into pale shadows by what this new era can create. It will open up a closer and freer interchange between human minds, and it may well be hoped a kindlier interchange between human hearts and lives. Nor need its achievements stop here, but might proceed to greater things of which these will only be the beginnings. The last line, of course, he's really hinting at the opening of the spiritual age, which is something greater than this. So all these are great things which we very frankly, do not yet see, especially the last, if you know what I mean, the, given the perilous state of international relations and in many societies, there have been a lot of disharmony. So 
he really is predicting a much better state than what we are in now. But what we are passing through now seems to be a necessary stage of disharmony that must be passed through in order to reach that greater coincidence oppositorium, that greater coincidence of opposites that will bring about that harmony that he's really talking about. Actually, this is really the last point I'm making. The other part is what we call the Atlantean arc. That part is something I do not have time to touch a lot on. Personally, it, like what Shri uh, Vladimir has introduced, my own spirituality is kind of a synthesis between Sri Aurobindo's integral yoga and Christianity. I mean, if people ask me whether I'm Christian, I'll say yes, definitely. But I'm also a follower of Sri Aurobindo. But there is something that I'm also have always been in, very interested in, and that is Atlantis. It took me many, 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 many years before I fully understood why I should be in. I believe that Atlantis has something very much to do with mental subjectivism. I do not have the time to, this cannot be done in this seminar already. It's in my article. What I can do is only to briefly talk on the very, uh, should we say, the big picture of what this is about and why Atlantis, which is supposedly just a myth, is actually going to be extremely important in this mental subjectivist stage. So the first thing to establish is that uh, there is going to be a new science, which already Sri Aurobindo talks about, where the subliminal being opens up collectively. And that, of course, is development of occultism. I think we will not read this part, but what it says here, which you can refer to, is that occult science is basically the science of the subliminal. It's the deployment of the knowledge of the subliminal world. So it's very obvious and natural that in the sub mental subjectivist communities, occult science will become the science. Physical science will be extended upwards as if the periodic table has grown many, many stories. Now we have a flat periodic table of a couple of uh, hundred over elements, but occult science will be hundreds of elements on top, hundreds of stories on top of that. So it's a far richer and multifarious kind of technology and science can be developed. It is something that will supplant our physical science. So in short, really, we are talking about a curve that move upward like that, as I mentioned earlier, we should not be looking at a transhumanist technological future. That's what people imagine will take place, but really that's not what Shri Aurobindo writes. And if you look at many signs carefully, this is not what's going to happen. We are not going to be merged with the machine and be overrun with it. Uh, and of course, after this uh, mental subjectivist age, we will close with Okay, maybe close to the wrong word in a progressive philosophy like Sri Aurobindo, but we will reach the spiritual age, which is really the real goal, right? It, and we reach there when in the mental subjectivist community, we no longer even say that mind, mind maya purusha, I mean the, the mental being is the ultimate reality. Instead, it is the spirit, however defined, the divine, however defined, that is the ultimate reality. When we reach that collective understanding, then the spiritual age will open up. So he, I only read the first part. The true secret can only be discovered if in the third stage, in the age of mental subjectivism, the idea becomes strong of the mind itself as no more than a secondary power of the spirit's working and of the spirit as the great eternal, the original, and in spite of the many terms in which is both expressed and hidden, the soul reality. So only when we reach that part, then the spiritual age will open up. So today's talk is really not really directly about the spiritual age. It's about the age we are in, which I think is a mental subjectivist age. Uh, and we are about to enter, in fact, into the cumulative, cumulative stage. But that opens up the door to the supra, full supramental manifestation, the spiritual age, which Sri Aurobindo's real work is about. So I just want to set that in context. Okay, and now we, I will just very, very briefly, this is a highly simplified argument that you, um, it's not, why Alantis is sort of relevant, we can discuss it a bit more in the Q&A, but to really so-called stretch out the case will require a much longer time. Essentially, Sri Aurobindo did mention Alantis a few times, not many, it's clearly not, uh, like for instance, in this one of his very early work, 1910, I think, he talks about this old, according to dim traditions and memories of the old world of such a nature, the civilization of old Atlantis. 
which was when, when man was intellectually developed, mighty in scientific knowledge and the mastery of gross and subtle nature, using the elements as his servants and the world as his footstool, but undeveloped in heart and spirit, become only an inferior kind of asura using the powers of demigod to satisfy the nature of an animal. In essence, Atlantis, according to the little few hints that Sri Aurobindo gave in his works, is a precocious civilization, a very old one, that went to the extreme of occult knowledge. That's his exact words in the letters on yoga, extreme of occult knowledge. And if Atlantean civilization attained an extremely developed and generalized inner knowledge, then actually it's actually quite equivalent to say it has actually attained to a degree the stage of mental subjectivism. And while Actually, Sri Aurobindo does not say so directly. A holistic consideration of his writings indicate that mental subjectivism is not a stage that humanity is attaining for the first time. It's actually a stage that humanity is recovering. I think that is the main point I'm trying to make. I believe that Atlantis actually represents a kind of abortive attempt to reach mental subjectivism, but it was too far ahead of its time, uh, among other reasons. And the experiment did not end well. Regardless of that fact, it is actually, to me, very likely, as I say, I don't have time nor the ability at this point to prove the case, so to speak, or to give a richer context to what I'm saying. But I believe that what we so-called Atlantean culture artifacts and ideas are actually likely to resurface if they haven't already done so. Um, in as we re-enter into the, this, because this is how nature works, you see, even if the previous experiment has been unsuccessful, property has this way of uh, burying the old thing and digging it up again at the right time. Like how, one example is how the Renaissance in Europe, right, rediscovered Greco-Roman civilization, which collects about a thousand years before. So Atlantis maybe collects, uh, you photo Plato's dates, maybe uh, 10,000 years before. Um, and these things are likely to resurface both the good uh, and the bad. In fact, I would actually like to argue there's a strong logical case that Atlantis civilization may never have gone extinct. So whatever it might be, the past and present of Atlantis is actually likely to exercise a decisive influence as humanity recovers the stage of mental subjectivism. It's Before I move on to the question, I have believed that, again, this is a mix of good and bad news. Because the general myth of Atlantis in many traditions, whether you accept the great flood of the Bible or Plato's original idea or some of those Edgar Cayce things or what Sri Aurobindo and the mother briefly hinted at, we all know that Atlantis ended with a bang. I mean, that's without a doubt. And generally speaking, it is believed that parts of Atlantis became corrupted at the end. There was some kind of civil war. So we ask, why, why is that even important? I think it's important because I already said, because I believe the good and the bad will recover itself. So it is quite possible that before we reach the spiritual age, before the forces of darkness are decisively defeated, there may well be something like a final battle or a final conflict. This final battle or final conflict need not be necessarily a military conflict. It could be a spiritual conflict, but I think there will be a final battle of some kind where the forces of darkness must be defeated decisively. Of course, in 1956, they know the end is near, right? But the final battle has not come. Clearly, their influence is still strong in the world, although fading. I mean, I need not justify that obvious fact. The, I believe that that old fall of Atlantis will have some implication for what is to come in the next few decades. Regardless, I believe that before we enter into the great harmony, we need to pass through some disharmony and maybe even this final conflict, maybe spiritual conflict, maybe military conflict, we hope it's spiritual, then we'll reach the spiritual age. So I would say that ultimately, and very importantly, it is a hopeful note that we should end because whatever may come in the decades ahead, some good, some bad, but definitely extraordinary, I think the end is clear. I mean, we already know and have faith that with the coming of the supramental, the world must and will be transformed. There is no uh, if and buts about that. The question is how we get there, of course. And so, but I believe we will get there. And there are many extraordinary things that will happen in the meantime. 
both good and bad, however, according to our narrow little human minds. But we can look forward in the next few decades to great changes and to entering the age of mental subjectivism. So I end my, as what Vladimir has said, overly long uh, talk here. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Jared. Wonderful, uh, very good, very thought-provoking um, presentation. Could you please stop yeah, sharing? Thank you. There are some questions here, many questions. I myself have questions, but I can discuss it with you separately. There is a question. Uh, I am a high school educator in Delhi, Jared. What would you suggest to us in the light of mental subjectivism as we are involved with the teaching learning process with the youth? Thank you. How to, how to kind of approach this issue of mental subjectivism, how to see it more, most probably, how to deal with it in the educational environment and especially with the youth, which is more subjective, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think earlier, Chianti, my friend, did a seminar with right. the group on education in the large share window. I think what we need to, my own view is that there is no formula, there is no fixed way because every human, every child is plastic at a different stage of development. And so I think we have to remain open to the possibilities before us. If we are met with a child who has, I will give a concrete example, for instance, I actually teach in high school myself. I mean, among the things I do. So I have met kids, for instance, who have developing subliminal abilities in lucid dreaming, for instance. I think most of us know what that is, right? That means they have the ability to be awake in their dreams. So if I meet kids like that who have things, I will actually tell them a bit about lucid dreaming and let them discover and let them develop in this area. But very obviously, not everyone can do lucid dreaming. So for other students, maybe you you reach them on their level, provoke their thoughts that the future is changing, that the future is unexpected and extraordinary, that you need to look beyond money. And because really, it's actually very likely we'll see a semi-collapse of social structures as we go ahead in the future. Um, with automation and all that, we will see a semi-collapse of social structure, the upheaval and the contest with the East and West, the rise of China and all those things. The world is changing beneath our feet. So, Using this, we can provoke them to think deeper. So what really matters in life and things like that. So I would say really, we have to be open to the unexpected and ask the mother for guidance in each case. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, so there is uh, Marcella's uh, writing. Um, I congratulate your initiative. The conference is very interesting. The question is, my question is, what is the relationship between the technology in advance and manifestation of our inner mind? That basically is what you were trying to say. But what are the relations between these two? Well, hmm. From my slides, I only brought up one relation, which is that it is a preparation because naturally nature will work with the outer mind first. So as we enter into the mental subjectivist age, naturally we will push ahead with the fullest development of the external mind. And that includes technology, especially technology that augments our intelligent powers, i.e. computers, uh, internet. It is a natural development. But that development cannot stop there because we, we realize that with all this development, we, we grow a bit sick and tired of it with our smartphones and social media and, <laughs> and Google. And we realize all these things don't solve the fundamental problems. And because of that, we realize that maybe the ultimate is not sufficient. Then we start turning inwards. We start searching for more. So I would say one line, I mean, of course, there are a lot of other things which I can talk about, but one line of relation is that it exhausts us. It makes us realize that physical technology is not, or should I say the external mind, even when supremely augmented, is not sufficient. And that will cause us to search more deeply for something greater, a greater intelligence. Of course, the other one, which I very briefly mentioned, is that um, I believe that physical technology might provide some kind of aid to the eventual creation of, even to the, to the whatever we are doing in the supramental age, like for instance, chemistry cannot be completely irrelevant in, in uh, the creation of supramental bodies. Of course, 
But these are highly speculative, so I really didn't want to bring those in. I would argue more for the first. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It seems to me, says Karundas, uh, that uh, the widespread use of Zoom and video conferencing <laughs> is a hidden gateway to the development of the inner powers of the mind. <laughs> After <laughs> all, <laughs> we are collective uh, being trained to feel the persons, uh, personas of each other through a digital representation. Increasingly, mm. we, we seem to be finding the reality of that inner connection, soul to soul, through these surface representations. It's quite an interesting. Certainly, certainly. No, I fully and hundred percent agree. I've been doing some meditation with. I mean, uh, all of us know that you know during Darshan, the last two Darshan days, the Samadhi has been sort of broadcast through YouTube to the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is another clear sign. Can we tap? Can we reach the presence of the mother through YouTube? You know, that is that is an exercise. That is an exercise of our inner being, like it or not. Right. Definitely, as I say, this year has marked an acceleration. I think this is a very good point, not something I brought out. That in the end, the physical technology will augment the development of our inner self in many, many ways. Right, right. Even if it harms it in some way. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. That is also the question from mm. uh, one person. Is this belief of the new era being very close by only a myth? Is this just mm. a way to keep the believers optimistic that, that uh, what we are chasing is just a small mm. distance afar? Every time in Indian philosophy, we find that uh, it is said Satya Yuga is just around the corner, but never are we there, just chasing the mm. distant star. I, I said earlier, I have a Christian faith, right? I think the Christians, we Christians are the best at this, right? I mean, even in the early years when of the Christian era, people were expecting the end of the world already. That was 2,000 years ago, and yet the world hasn't ended. So I think that is, that is uh, uh, definitely that, when, especially when there is crisis and things, we do, want, we do want to believe, right? And if we do want to believe, that of course distorts our thinking, and therefore whatever we think should be less credible. So we need to give full validity to that point of view and that doubt. Having said that, <laughs> I think, Mm, if we judge by what Sri Aurobindo has said, and if you have some faith in what he writes, and if you match it pretty objectively to what has happened in the world for the last 70 years, I think it's hard to deny something quite fishy, in a good sense, is going on. Yeah, and of course, if we further believe in the Great Acceleration in 1956, I think nothing of what I said is irrational. So while going, giving the full validity to what is that we should be doubtful sometimes, that we want to believe what we want to believe. I think even a cool, calm, objective consideration of the facts as they stand, given our own faith or in the supramental manifestation of 56 and in what Sri Aurobindo has written, I believe it's a clearly reasoned position. Yeah, I mean, without resorting to divine inspiration and all, I mean, it is, I think, a clearly reasoned position. Of course, we all resort to divine inspiration. Everything is possible. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. right. There is also a request from someone to to mm. to leave in the chat the reference to your book that uh, or to your article. Sorry, for, on Atlantis and mental subjectivism. If you have mm. it uh, uh, somewhere the, in the form that it can be downloaded, so you can leave the reference. Or uh, send to us, we send to every participant. Yeah, uh, for sure. I will send you the latest. I'm amending one part. I mean, okay. the old article I sent to you already, but now yes. after I did the talk, I thought the new points came, and so I thought you will, I will amend the article. Right, yeah. wonderful. Uh, there is also a question from Josie Lammers. Thank mm. you, Jared, for this profound talk. My question is what the influence will be of the Lemurian culture, free Atlantic, <laughs> culture. on the golden age that is uh, spiritual culture in the future? No, okay. I mean, I, I know about the Lemurians, but I do not uh, know in the sense of knowing Atlantis, which is my real focus. All I know of the Lemurians is they are supposed to be, okay, I mean, there are various traditions again, right? 
One of which is that they are more like a giant Qigong masters that have mastered the vital plane to a vast extent. There is one poem in Sri Aurobindo where he sort of take on a fictional persona and talk about how he mastered the old Lemurian yogas, which he sort of likened to some kind of pranayama. So Qigong, in other words, the mastery of the life form. So if this kind of thing is true, then maybe the Lemurians re represent a cycle where the life force, it is a true vital subjectivism. It might have been speculatively, it's completely speculatively, a true vital subjectivism. What Atlantis later represented uh, the fullest development of mental subjectivism. So that is my take. It does fit the evolutionary structure and that particular, I think the poem was called Mahatna or something. In one, it's one of Sri Aurobindo's collected poems where he wrote from the perspective mm -hmm. of Lemurians, Atlantean, and then and so on. Yeah. But this is purely speculative. I have never given much attention or thought to Lemuria. Almost all my attention has always been focused on Atlantis for many reasons. Yeah, so, yeah. In, in Theosophy, the, this, uh, the Blavatsky deals with Lemurian mm, culture yes. and Atlantis. But yes. these are yeah, pre-cultures, so to say, pre-historic uh, societies. Mm. And they, they remind me of the stages or the, the structures of consciousness in Gebser, you know, in the uh, magic structure and then the mythical structure and finally mental structure of consciousness. Mm. Some, some kind of that development. Thank you. Possibly. Yeah, well, could be, but just again, it's a blind interpretation of. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. there, is, well, there is one more question and I mm. will read to you. Mm. Mm. Do you find similarity between Lal Dead and Sri Aurobindo? That means Lal Dead is from Kashmiri Shaivism, and he's. Um, there was a question mm. about uh, Laleshwari. Of uh, Laleshwari, I do not know this work, and Sri Aurobindo as a yogi. Do you find. What similarities do you find between Kashmiri Shaivism and Sri Aurobindo's oh. integral philosophy? Well, it's just oh, no. <laughs> not now. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, well, that's my thesis. That's my master's thesis mm. at Oxford. It was on Abhinava Gupta and Sri Aurobindo. Having said that, I do not want to claim to know more because to really know a tradition, you have to practice it. So I would say that I have practiced uh, Christian. I mean, Christian prayer, of course, mm. and I practice integral yoga. And my knowledge of Atlantis is not nearly theoretical. So, but the fact is, <laughs> Kashmiri Shaivism, um, I, would, I mean, we believe in truth, right? So I just bluntly say, Kashmiri Shaivism, when I did it, I did, I did not practice it. So to me, that was more intellectual exercise. So because of that, I told Vladimir that I actually didn't want to talk about Kashmiri Shaivism, which you are a bit of, because I believe you want to talk about something, you should have some authentic experience with it. Um, so this question, while I can answer to some degree on the intellectual level, is really just on the intellectual level. And very briefly, I would say that Abhinav Gupta's philosophy, which represents supposedly the highest point of Kashmiri Shaivism, is surprisingly similar to Sri Aurobindo's uh, integral yoga. Yeah, he, they have this idea of what we can call an integral monism, where everything is one and yet differentiated. I'm putting it very, very, very simplistically. But a very interesting difference is that, very weirdly, from my intellectual knowledge, is that Abhinava Gupta don't seem to have arrived at this idea of um, transforming the body and then the world. Despite the very interesting fact they have very, a great similarity of philosophy, this idea of bringing down the spirit in some sense and transforming the body and the whole world is really quite unique to Sri Aurobindo. And the interesting thing is really, why is it that they started with such similar metaphysic and they ended with such different uh, sacrology, that means different way of viewing, so to speak, uh, mm. salvation this is a loaded word, but uh, yeah, it's a technical term. But so that's all I can say. I mean, this is intellectually, but you see my understanding of Kashmiri Shaivism might well be distorted by the fact I never practice it. Um, so this is just my observation. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. But we shouldn't give too much credence. <laughs> yeah, we should try. He wanted to well, put on yes. Yes. Those who studied yes, Kashmiri Abhinav Gupta, they know that mm. similarity is put quite profound. But yes. it, truly speaking, what you say is absolutely true. It's surprising mm. that he is not arriving at this necessity of transformation of life. Or maybe it is implied, but it is not explicitly pointed out or put as, a, as an aim of life. Maybe it's so implied. Legend, so the legend is that Abhinav Gupta with his disciples at the end of his life went to a cave and sort of disappeared, you see. So we do know that disappearing from a cave is not the end goal of integral yoga. However important it may be as a stage towards the final consummation. I mean, having said all that, I mean, we don't want to get into the debate or which spiritual path is greater or worse. I mean, the point is that everything moves like a stage, right? like what we just said, this building up of the planetary infrastructure of AI and computers and all that. It's an inferior thing. Of course, it's inferior compared to what it's become. But does it mean it's useless? It does not mean it's useless. In fact, it's a very great thing in itself. We need to see it for why it is. So Alantis rose and fell I am of the belief that Atlantis still exists, actually. Uh, I don't have time to justify it, but the fact is it fell in some sense. Does it mean Atlantis was worthless and useless? Clearly not, because it's likely that whatever it did will be dressed up again in, as we re-enter the stage. So everything, nature weighs nothing. I mean, that's probably how it works. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Of course, there is much more in Kashmiri sh sh mm. than we just mentioned here. There is no explicitly shown the aim, shown the aim for, mm. for transformation of all life, society, and so on. That Shira Bindo did, yes, but there is transformation is taking place definitely. There is a, there is a remark made here by some attendees. So um, mm. I agree. Uh, so we cannot really touch deeply this subject now, especially if mm. when our time is over <laughs> so <laughs> I, will, I will have to stop uh, now and um, uh, I thank you very much uh, there is a great feedback from many people for this clarity in the mind and making it more realistic that it is not mm. just uh, somewhere you know imagination or some kind of wish or some myth it is already yeah. happening myth in the making myth in the making I would say as a last word that we should, I mean, we really need to have hope, especially when everything seems to be against us. Uh, my own view, as I said, is that we, actually you may say that I believe in things that I want to believe in, but actually I said quite clearly in the talk, what is coming in the next few decades is not paradise. What is coming in the next few decades is a mix of light and darkness, possibly even a final battle before we reach the spiritual age. In other words, so we are looking for times which will be challenging, where we need to solve problems, and which is why we need to be warriors for the future. Like what the mother has to say, we have to have this faith uh, that no matter what is thrown in us, the future is assured. Mm -hmm. And we have the grace and the supramental descent behind to make it true to that final transformation. But I'm not saying it's, uh, it's a Pollyanna thing. There will be many obstacles, many mm. challenges to be surmounted. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Jared. It was wonderful to yeah. be with you. And I, um, I will send you the feedback and the questions. Mm. Please leave your feedback and questions in the, in the form which we supply after this uh, webinar. And I mm. wish to meet with you again and to discuss again <laughs> in depth the futuristic uh, vision of our mm. uh, life. Thank you, Jared. All the best. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thanks, Vladimir. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'll leave. Uh...